That was nice. How much is that worth? <laughs> Welcome to Left Directing 118. That was uh, our boy Rick DeSantis, who has a laugh that can cut both ways. As a very bad guy, it's a it's a ludicrous laugh. <laughs> it's it's endearing. <laughs> it's <laughs> I just I'm blown away by that laughter. Like <laughs> I'm sorry. The more that that we're going to be discovering about his mannerisms, I think it's only going down here here for DeSantis, right? Yeah. But like it's it's like I I usually have a rule that I'm breaking in this case of the emergency that is Ron DeSantis's public you know life, um, do a rule against making fun of people laughing because people can't people should be uh, uh you know encouraged to express laughter and joy as they do, but man that is a very it, it's like a throwback it's like like. I, it reminds me, I, I'm trying to think of, it reminds me of Trading Places or something. Like, that's a mm. 1980s laugh. Mm -hmm. um, and if it was, if that was, dude. if that was Bernie Sanders' laugh, it would be just massively endearing. Here, as a guy who was like a deep state lawyer for Guantanamo, mm. it's a little bit um, freakish and uh, concerning. So, yeah, that's a, our boy Ron DeSantis. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> But uh, anyways, back to who Ron DeSantis wants to overthrow uh, in the upcoming presidential election, which he might actually uh, enter. Uh, there's some news on the Joe Brandon front. Uh, first, with regards to this debt limit uh, manufactured crisis uh, over some um, parliamentary bullshit that Biden could choose to dispense with, but decide he's going to play along with uh, regarding us him hitting our debt limit we should just not have one of those um uh, you want to lower the def debt and deficit you tax rich people uh biden had been talking a tough game about not going to cut social security medicaid medicare so tough that you're like why are you saying that so much and why aren't why aren't you just stopping after no cuts Mm -hmm. And it's unclear now, so we won't be too definite, but what actually the door's been opened for some cuts and it's things like work, which by the way, aren't cuts. Like it, it, it involves a massive bureaucracy to harass people. I mean, it, it, basically what it does is it lets the state deny people um, services that they are entitled to. Right. Exactly. Right. Exactly. And so um, they're, they're talking about work recurrence now. And I just feel that's it's it's sickening. That at no point did was there intervening stage where, like the Democrats thought, oh maybe we would like bring up the, all these massive tax cuts for rich people. Mm -hmm. No, it's like oh we want to get serious and sensible. Well, the serious and sensible thing is to make people working that have no, found a capital. The Republican Party basically everything that they want. I and mean like, exactly, and you have to wonder like how much do Democrats not want this either? I mean, this is like what we're getting down to fundamentally. I know we're going to talk about the UAW thing in just a second, but like we're entering this season again, where if you say anything about Joe Biden and the Democratic Party, then this loud chorus comes out and says, well, what about Trump? I'm sorry, friends. Like it's 2023 at this point. Like I thought that was a ludicrous argument back in 2015, 2016. But like we are now starting to approach like a decade of this where you know we can watch as our um, our rights sort of get pulled back we can watch as working class people's lives get worse and you can't just keep on bringing up the specter of trump to say we can't criticize the democratic party or that we can't be putting pressure on what they're doing because you know if the argument is like well life's going to get worse or we might lose things like medicare and medicaid under a trump right well what's the argument when we basically see these things continue to be under threat and continue to be rolled back when the thing that you guys are arguing for happens right when the democrats win the big election um and something fundamentally needs to shift beyond just sort of putting the right away um you know in in a presidential election every once in a while like the democratic party fundamentally is a party that is willing to make these kinds of cuts and these yeah. kind of sacrifices you know in our name right they're not the ones I mean, who are losing so, out the yeah. healthcare, right? Which is why it's so sick. That's the funny thing about language, because you say they're making these sacrifices. It's like, no, <laughs> they're going home and eating ice cream. And yeah. everyone, a whole bunch of other people's lives get a whole bu a bunch more pressed. And that's just b American business as usual. And so 
that news, I think, uh, made me especially greet this new uh, Paul Prescott piece in Jacobin. UAW is right to withhold its endorsement of Joe Biden. And specifically, they're citing uh, all this money with regards to the um, inf- Inflation Reduction Act. Um, but Biden needs to make sure that this is union labor with regards to like electronic vehicles, electric vehicles. We've discussed this um, on the show before. And this is like the time to do this. I mean, you saw what happened when the rail workers did the Democrats a solid say, hey, we'll wait till after the midterms to make this a uh, rail uh, strike uh, uh, an issue. They fucked them. <laughs> you got to make it now. You got like strike while the iron's hot. And so, yeah, none of that, you know. And by the way, it's not like UAW's like toying with the idea that they're going to endorse Trump, right? Mm-hmm. They're clear about that too. But the, it should cost something. And I, I mean, I think a great sign from Sean Fain and UAW. No, I mean, I think in this, the Paul Prescott piece was a great um, retelling of it. People should definitely read it. But I mean, I think it, it it hits at something that hopefully we're starting to see more from organized labor is that they're not just going to rubber stamp, uh, you know, Joe Biden and the Democratic Party, which is a shift that just desperately needs to happen. Right. You could talk about what people might need to do when you get into a general election. Right. Um, but at, at a certain point. If those people aren't held accountable, they will continue to wage war on working class people, right? Because it's like this idea that a lot of people have um, that like the Democratic and the Republican Party is sort of like gradient, right? Like there's like our politics and then there's like the left liberal politics and then there's the Republican politics when um, is, is, is incorrect when what functionally the Democratic and the Republican Party are are two parties that represent the interests of capital, two parties that are very, very comfortable with seeing living standards for working class people decline. And the Democratic Party traditionally had some more union support. But as we've seen, and this is the really frightening thing about Joe Biden's presidency, is that their strategy that they're trying to build up around him and the new chapter of the Democratic Party is not trying to win back labor, is not trying to win back working people, but rather trying to pull away at wealthy voters in the suburbs, um, particularly in the South. Right. So then whose class interests are the ones that are listened to the most by the Biden Democratic Party? It's wealthy professionals. Right. So understanding that, yes, the Republican Party represents the bosses and the elites. Um, and but so does the Democratic Party. And this idea that the role of unions and organized labor and working class politics right now is to sort of shut up and sit down as Biden actively does things, for example, like the railroad strike, blocking the railroad strike. Right. Again, I'll just say this for the thousandth time, because I think a lot of people forget this. This was not some act of God. This was not something that was forced upon him by the Republican Party. This was something that Joe Biden said to Congress. I need you guys to pass um I need you guys to pass something on this, right? He brought this into motion. It wasn't something that was forced upon him. He took the active role in denying people their right to withhold their labor in order to get a better contract, right? And you can't just take this deal from them in perpetuity, which a lot of liberals basically are arguing that like, because we dislike the right, which we do, and we think the right is a threat to this country and the working people, which we do. Therefore, we should accept whatever the Democratic Party does or wants to do to working people. That is a recipe for further declines um, in, in the living standards of working people, further declines in the union movement. And it's really good to start to see members of, of unions, particularly unions as powerful and embedded as the UAW saying, no, we're not going to play this game anymore until you all start showing up for us. And the stuff here is simple, right? That they're demanding. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's exactly. This isn't even like the pro act. Yeah. Right. This is like, hey, you know the how you're giving these industries a massive amount of cash? Can we like make sure they don't use that to just undermine the like labor victories over the past century? Is that too much to fucking ask? Yeah, I mean, exa- and, you know, again, just to be very clear, what they're saying is the if the government is going to be pushing forward a, a project like um, IRA, um, that is going to be trying to encourage more electric vehicles, don't let the electric, ve- uh, so don't let the big three, the big car companies, use this to undermine labor. This is simple for, again, for a president, by the way, who likes to tout himself as, you know, quote unquote, union Joe. Simple as they, and the fact that this is controversial for anybody um is ridiculous and i'm happy to see um figures um like in like the like in the uaw push back on this finally um because it's been too long of just rubber stamping um you know democratic party politicians um without demanding that they start showing up and fighting for working people yeah absolutely 
Well, folks, um, we're going to we got some really cool stuff coming up um, in the uh, next few weeks on Left Reckoning. And don't I just want to remind folks in a second, we're going to have Vivek Chibber on the program and we're going to be talking about false consciousness, imperialism um, and what the state of the left is now that Bernie Sanders is not going to be running for president anymore. Um, but don't forget, after that, we're going to have Matt Huber on the program. Uh, which we're always really excited for. And uh, he's going to be in the post game. So we'll be able to leave calls and questions for him. Um, and we're going to be talking about some of his critics um, who've been criticizing his great book, Climate Change, as class war, um, particularly one that was in historical materialism, the journal, um, which I'm really looking forward to having uh, you know Matt on to talk about that. And if you have any questions or things you might... We wanted to ask him, be sure to sign up at patreon.com slash left reckoning to get access to that. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, sorry to double back to the segment, yeah. um, but there's one thing I did, you know, that's not just theoretical what you're saying about the preferred voter of the Democratic Party leadership. Um, Bill Clinton, the Democratic Leadership Council, explicitly that was strategy about um, with regards to like educated vote, college educated voters and things like that. But as recently as 2016, Chuck Schumer was in the headlines mm -hmm. saying for every voter that Trump picks up in certain demographics, we'll pick up two in the suburbs. And they did not. And yeah. so, you know, I think if, you, if your concern, like you should be a little bit more open to uh, challenge to those types of folks. No, I mean, I, I think so. And like, I think it's very important that, again, this isn't like a theory on our part. This is something that's becoming explicit. Uh, from the Democratic Party. And like, you know, th they may have some success at times like in a state like Georgia. I think it's incredibly dangerous and damaging in a state like Texas, uh, where, by the way, I don't have the email up yet, but the Texas Democratic Party, I mean, of course, they got to, you know, pump, you know, hit their chest a couple times in a fundraising email. Um, but they're basically saying, oh, it looks like Texas is going to turn blue in 2024. Um, something I've been hearing my entire adult yeah, life. Sounds familiar. Um, <laughs> we'll believe it when we see it. Um, but again, folks, if you want to be joining us for the conversation with Matt Huber, be sure uh, to join us in the post game at patreon.com slash left reckoning. Um, I think uh, is, is Vivek here. I'm not seeing him on camera. Um, uh, let's see here. Um, let's bring him on. See. Hey, Vivek, can you hear us? We might be having an yeah. Issue. We might be having a little tech issue. Um, let's see here. Should we take a little break and uh, yeah, we can take a little the... break. All right, we'll be right back, folks.
little quick tech issue, um, but I think we are all settled and we're ready to bring on our guest for this evening, uh, Vivek Chibber. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, it's my pleasure. You guys can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you perfect. Really appreciate okay, it. Sure. Sure. Yeah. Um, well, folks, if you don't already know, uh, Vivek Chibber is a professor of sociology at NYU, uh, editor of Catalyst, author of many books, including The Great Class Matrix, which you all should definitely be reading. Um, and, uh, you know, somebody who we're really thrilled to be hanging out with and talking to uh, this week on Left Reckoning. Um, again, really appreciate uh, you taking some time to talk with us. And we got a lot of things uh, I think that we want to get into today. Um, but I wanted to like one reason I really wanted to bring you onto this uh, onto this program um, is to talk just a little bit about false consciousness because it's something that I think pops up on the left a lot and I think it can be really damaging right and there's a few different versions of this theory there's the more academic one and then there's the more like I don't know like pop lefty version of this and you hear it from like left socialists to liberals with this kind of common refrain that like you know working class people don't understand their interests or working class people vote against their interests um we hear that a lot here in in texas you know, for why the democratic party for example is a dominant in the state and i was just wondering if you could sort of talk us through why that understanding um is wrong and also probably isn't very helpful for doing politics in the u.s well um False consciousness is, as you said, um, David, it's used in many different ways. Um, and in some ways, what it conveys is, is not entirely wrong. And in other ways, it's spectacularly wrong. So there's two different ways in which people understand the term. Um, one is it's a false understanding of one's basic interests. And what do we mean by basic interests? We mean, well, what is it that I really need in life? in order to have some chance at leading a decent life. So these would be my basic health, my basic autonomy as a human being, self-determination, uh, the need to have decent relationships with other people, the need to have security, material security. These are my basic interests. Then there's, it's also used to refer to how I go about understanding the pursuit of those interests. So there's what I need, and there's the best strategy for acquiring what I need. Now, in traditional Marxism, false consciousness was a term Marx and Engels never used. It's a term that's used by their followers uh, in very sporadic fashion. It really becomes used widely after the Second World War by the New Left. And when they use it, they typically use it to mean a false understanding of one's basic interests. So, and why do they use it that way? Well, they're trying to understand why workers don't get up and rebel, why they don't fight against their bosses. And the idea was that Marx told us workers, because they're exploited, because they're treated badly, they're going to see sooner or later that what they ought to be doing is fighting for their interests by coming together. Now, because you don't see them coming together to fight for those interests, the idea is, well, they just don't understand that they have these interests. Now, the difficulty with that is that you're assuming that people have a fundamental cognitive deficiency because you don't have to be a rocket scientist to know I don't like being bossed around. I need some basic security in my life. I need some healthy relationships with the people around me. Uh, it's a kind of a far-fetched notion to think that this, these are things you have to be taught because mm -hmm. all of human history is basically being driven forward by people trying their best to secure these things for themselves. Now. The mistake that the new left made was in thinking that when you're exploited or when you're oppressed, the automatic way you're going to resist is by banding together. They were right in understanding that people are exploited. They were right in understanding that they're going to resist the exploitation. They were mistaken in, mistaken in thinking the automatic way of resisting the exploitation is through collective action, through coming together. It's in, in fact, what I try to argue in my book is that the more natural response on the part of workers to fight for their basic interests is to resist individually mm. because there's it's so dangerous in a workplace to come together and try to organize a union because you're gonna get first thing that's gonna happen is you're gonna get fired mm -hmm. so if you're not organizing it's not because you're too dumb to know what you need in life it's because you're smart enough to know that it's better to hold on to a shitty job than to have no job at all the misunderstandings on the part of these these intellectuals will come down and say, 
we know your situation better than you do. And if you don't do what we think you ought to be doing, it must be because you're stupid. Mm -hmm. Now, what that leads to is an incredible elitism on the part of the left, where instead of what the traditional left used to do, which is to go to where workers are, try to understand why they're responding the way they are, because you assume that they understand their situation better than you understand their situation, since they have to live in it, and you're just a Johnny come lately, you just got there. You try to assume that they're rational, assume that they're reasonable people, assume that they know what these basic goods are in life, and then you try to figure out why would a reasonable, rational, rational person make the choices that they're making? What, what happened with the rise of the university as the site of left-wing theorizing is people who have no connection to workers' everyday lives are answering questions that to which they have no information and they have no answers. So it's easy to fall into this elitism. Now on the second issue, which is, okay, how do we try to bring together a strategic vision that fulfills the need for our basic interests? On that, yeah, you can fool workers. Why? I know I need a job. I know I want security. And I now need to know what kind of state legislation or policies are going to help me secure those things. Well, I don't know. I'm not an economist. I'm not somebody who studies the stuff I'm studying. I'm working 16 hours a day. So I rely on information from say the media, from politicians, from experts. And when they tell me the best way to get security is through tariffs or through shutting down immigration or by kicking out all the immigrants, I'm like, okay, well, maybe that makes sense. So I vote for the guy who's saying, kick out all the immigrants. I vote for the guy who says, we need white privilege. We need white um, uh, pride and things like that, right? That's not because I'm too stupid to know that this guy is not going to give me what I need. It's because I have no way of assessing whether or not what he's saying is true or not, because I don't directly experience those things. Those things that I directly experience, I'm pretty, it's hard to fool me. But the things that require external knowledge, yeah, you can fool me about those things. So a false consciousness about matters that require external information, yeah, you can have that. That's just false information. Hmm. But false consciousness about my interests is not something that's going to be very common. And so when I look at people voting for the Republicans, I don't shit on them and say, these guys don't know the basic things. What I do is say the academics, the professors, the magazines, the media, they're all failing working class people because they do not give them the information that they need. Why? Well, because these are all elite institutions. These are all elite organs, the media, the politicians, et cetera. So we shouldn't be surprised that they're feeding them crap. And we shouldn't denigrate the workers when they lack the information to make better choices about interests that they actually quite accurately understand. You know, um, there, there's a piece I should have sent it to you that, you know, it's very rare in American media. Um, that they the, the Texas Monthly did um, this most recent midterm election where they interviewed non-voters, which they never do, right? Um, and th this journalist goes and talks, you know, predominantly like working class people in parts of Texas where people don't vote, and was just amazed at how intelligent they were and how well they understood the issues. And you know, people were talking about bank regulation to him, um, which again, like, just completely throws away, in my opinion, this kind of thesis that like. That, 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 that you see sometimes for folks that, uh, you know, working people don't understand sort of even like their class enemies. But um, listen, if you're actually trying to organize people, if you're actually trying to organize working class people and you have this view, you'll last about five seconds. Yeah. They'll just throw you out. They'll say, you don't know what the fuck you're talking about. So it, it just, this is redolent. This is indicative of a left that's basically siloed miles away from people's ordinary lives and doesn't bother to understand or try to understand why they're doing what they're doing. That's why Bernie Sanders was so important and so successful. He said to them, you're right. You are. It's understandable that you hate both parties because both parties are captured by people who are trying to screw you. And mm -hmm. that, that resonated with them. Well, um, I, I know there's some big stuff that I wanted to get to in a second, but just while we're on this, I'm just curious what, what you think about this too, because this is something that I come across a lot when I'm talking to people here. Um, which is this this kind of hurdle that I, I'm, I'm finding more and more with like, let's call it like democratic socialist politics. So even people who like might even come from certain backgrounds, no folks. When I talk to people, even, I, I live in the same neighborhood I grew up in, I, you know, I'm a working class kid, right? And I talk to people about these things that I want all the time. Um, and they love things like Medicare for all. They, they like things like the Green New Deal. But the thing that you always sort of rub up against is this like idea that like, oh, that's never going to happen, right? Like politics is not something that is going to improve my life. It's more likely than not something that is going to hinder 
my life, right? Whenever politics comes to my life, it's usually a bad thing. And it creates this kind of tension between where we are now and where we would want to be, where it's like we're not even trying to convince people on arguments as much as like trying to con convince people that like, oh, these avenues or these organizations or these movements might be something that's worthwhile for you to engage your time in. And I'm just curious if you have any thoughts uh, about how do we even start going about dealing with that kind of tension? Um, I think it's very hard to get people the people's cynicism is uh, entirely reasonable and rational. I, I don't see, uh, to me, the shocking thing is that working class people vote at all uh, <laughs> in this country. They haven't had a party representing them in about four generations now. So it's this, the cynicism itself is, I think of it as a reasonable response to their situation. It's also, of course, self-defeating because once you tune out and you give up, obviously you've conceded all the ground to the power centers, to employers, to the state, to politicians and all that. So it's self-defeating and in my mind bringing them out of it through the electoral arena is not likely to happen mm -hmm. because the electoral arena is so far removed from their lives and there's no you know people become less cynical when they see something actually happening something that's actually being done that makes it worth their while to participate now sanders thought that if he comes out and gives them a program in his in his uh, in his runs for president that is energizing that's hopeful that shows them that something is possible maybe they'll come out and what he found he knew that the electorate that actually votes it's going to be an uphill battle for him because that's more affluent voters who vote mm -hmm. he knew that the only chance he has of succeeding is if he brings out the half of the electorate that's given up and what we we saw was that it didn't happen People loved him, but they just thought there's no way he can win. The system is rigged. There's no point to it. So my lesson from that is the way to defeat cynicism is through fighting a different kind of battle, not the electoral battle. Mm -hmm. You need to organize in people's workplaces where they see that coming together, banding together for achievable goals, not the ultra left crap that you see on the student left. We want revolution now. It's 510. Where's my revolution? Um, achievable goals around everyday issues, now they start seeing the utility, the, the importance of collective organizing and collective action. Then you can start thinking, okay, now that we're all together, maybe we can hold some politicians accountable so that when they're in office, money doesn't do all the talking. But those are, you have to take steps to get there. I think trying to get people involved by saying, hey, I know this candidate and he's a really good candidate, and I think you should come out and vote, limited success. I, mm -hmm. I'd be surprised. So what the, the lesson is that success is the way to come out of cynicism, and you need to find battles around people's material interests that they can actually win, and then we'll see what happens. Mm -hmm. We've talked a lot about the uh, Labor Party and the need for both the Labor Party and the Labor Movement, which, forgive me, I'm not sure if you mentioned it in Confronting Capitalism or Class Matrix, but I'm curious, like, one thing that I thought about reading is that is you kind of need the Labor Movement first before you get the Labor Party, right? Like, or, like I'm just curious your response to that. It's very hard to say, uh, Matt, which it's a chicken and egg thing. Mm -hmm. um, my view is that what we saw... You know, I'm old enough now where I can talk like an old man. What we saw in the last like 25 years was that the left was thinking if we just build labor organizations, one factory or one plant or one Starbucks at a time, in a, we call it like a molecular fashion, one unit after the other, you can build the movement and then you can form the party. Or they thought, let's form a party. 18, 20 of us get together, we declare ourselves the Workers' Party of America, and then we'll go organize. And what you see is that neither has worked. You can't, you're not going to get a labor movement by organizing one establishment at a time because there's hundreds of thousands of them. And you can't just get 18 people in a room and say, we're the new labor party, mm -hmm. unless they have some organic connection to the people who they have declared their allegiance to. So we, there is no easy answer to this. If we figured it out, we obviously wouldn't be having this discussion. To my mind, one thing is clear, without a party, you're not going to get any kind of movement to the left. You're not going to get it through the nonprofits and the NGOs because that's where the left goes to die. 
you're not going to get it through university lefts, et cetera, because they essentially turn left ideas into self-promotion for upwardly mobile people. You're going to need a party, and that party is going to have to have an organic connection to the class. The difficulty is we don't yet know how to break out of our silos to do that. I think it, it's a mistake to think in a dogmatic fashion that this has to come first or that has to come first. We don't know. What we've seen in the past 50 years that the only time we've seen any sort of the needle moving at all is when you didn't have either of these things. It's when the national political stage changed literally overnight because of Sanders. Mm -hmm. And I think the reason that mattered so much was all the cynicism that David talked about, it was lifted for a second when people said, I'm not the only one feeling this way. And in fact, the, the, the other person who's saying to me, this whole situation is screwed up is somebody who actually has the power to maybe do something about it. Not some weirdo who shows up at my factory with purple hair who says, Hey, you want to read my newspaper? <laughs> yeah. So uh, to my mind, the, the big lesson out of this is we have to engage in the electoral arena in this country right now, because that's the one time everyone pays attention to politics mm -hmm. and try to parlay that into organizing. If we keep ourselves just in the electoral arena, we're going to get bought and sold and we're going to get clobbered. You use the elections as a springboard for the organizing and the organizing is what anchors you for building a left down the line. So um, I want to get back to like looking at like the the, the Bernie movement and, and sort of where it is now in, in a second. We're going to jump around just a little bit because um, there's something I, I really wanted to talk to you about because it's something that like frankly frightens the hell out of me just to see how quickly some people have moved on this stuff um, because you know we had this moment um, you know around the Bernie Sanders campaign particularly around ideas for example like the Green New Deal right which is we're going to deal with climate change working people are being screwed over and we need to fight for a better future and it took what a couple of years and I'm seeing all of these really perverse um, anti-worker mentality that's sort of popping up i don't know if you could even call it the left but popping up on the left right and it's all sort of couched in this understanding of imperialism right the idea being that the american workers sort of represent this privileged working class that gets everything off of the backs of you know colonialism and imperial exploitation um you know something that i i think is is rather dubious um and i also wonder how much like real solidarity um that that kind of conception builds with people in bolivia um, or in honduras but i'm just curious if, if you could talk a little bit broadly about this kind of understanding of imperialism that i'm just seeing i don't know maybe i'm just like spending too much time on weird sections of online you know and, and things like that but i have seen it become more frequent and it really does worry me a lot it's a very backward and uh, completely bankrupt idea actually and it's you're right. I've seen it come back around to not so much in this scholarship on international economics or something, because it was thoroughly discredited 30 years ago. And I'll, I'll talk about that in a second. Where you see it in the is in the kind of the, the Twitter left or the social media left, essentially, which is kind of a clubbishness of like minded people. And so I, I'm not sure how much traction it actually has, because these are mostly people who don't really do anything anyway. So, you know, if it were if we had a major socialist party or communist party and that became the, the organizing principle, then I'd be a lot more worried. Mm -hmm. But in these kind of social media eddies around the world, people, what I've, my, my sense is people don't care if they're right or wrong. They just write out what they're writing because it makes a certain target audience happy, you know, that mm -hmm. kind of thing, but it's there. And it does, I think, confuse a lot of people. So let me just, go back to the beginning, as it were, Th this idea has been around you know, since Marx and Engels' time. Marx also wondered why the British working class wasn't more radical than it was. Uh, Lenin again targeted the Brits and said, well, one big reason is it's the fruits of imperialism that have uh, the, their bosses have bought them and bribed them with the super profits that they're getting from the colonial countries. And the last time it came up was in the 1960s and 70s, mainly through the Maoist movement. It's, it was called third worldism. And the idea was that the Western working class is too comfortable, too rich for a variety of reasons, one of which they said was imperialism. And so the Western working class can't be counted on 
to be revolutionary. What you can count on is the global south, because the working class in the global south is being super exploited, and they're the ones who are producing all the wealth, which the West is capturing, bringing back, and bribing the workers with. Now, this became a real set target, of, a real issue of debate in the left globally in the 60s, 70s. And long story short, by the 80s, was thoroughly discredited on the left. Um, and for about 20, 25 years, you really didn't see this very much among socialist or Marxist intellectuals. It comes back about six or eight years ago, and it doesn't come back through the scholars that study uh, colonial imperial history, except for a few exceptions. It really comes up back through cultural studies and the cultural turn and the race angle, because the it, it's seen as a component of what's called this profoundly idiotic notion, global white supremacy. And so the West being white, it's one of the mechanisms by which it's enriched itself is by feeding off the workers of the global south. All right, now look, this is an empirical question. You can't just dismiss it. It's either right or wrong. So what what's wrong with it? Well, to you, there are certain kind of sniff tests you can do, even if you don't study this very much. The basic intuition, their sniff test by which they say this must be true is that, well, look, everybody's working hard. People in South Africa and India and in Namibia are working really hard. Workers over here are working hard. How come these workers here get rich and they don't? It must be because they're skimming off the surplus that workers over there are making. The fundamental problem with this empirically, theoretically, is this, that what determines the wealth of a country is what's called labor productivity what Marx called the production through relative surplus value. The reason the certain parts of the world get rich and the other ones don't is that in certain parts of the world, the kind of capitalism you have is one where there's a constant pressure for technological change and productivity improvements, the production of relative surplus value, and markets are constantly deepening and the rate of growth is accelerating. In the global South, what happened was the economic structure remained largely the same from 1800 to the late 1900s, and that was a very stagnant, low productivity agriculture. Now, when you have two workers working equally hard, one is working with very advanced machinery, the other is working with outmoded machinery, you're working really hard, but the surplus, the wealth that's going to be produced will be very different. The one with the advanced machinery is going to produce a lot more in a lot less time. The one with the outmoded machinery is going to produce a lot less in a lot of time. Now, that means you don't need to have the rich guy skimming off the surplus of the of the global south to be rich. He's just endowed with much better productivity because his capitalists are investing in different ways. So that sniff test that they use is profoundly mistaken. Now, let's use our sniff test. Could it be true that the West got rich from colonialism? Well, here's the basic problem with that. In the post-war era, England lost all of its colonies, all of them, by the 19 mid 1960s. If this third world, this argument were right, you should have seen a profound crisis of British capitalism in the 50s, 60s and 70s. What you in fact see is the 50s, 60s and 70s are the period of most rapid growth in the British economy it has ever had, including the Industrial Revolution. If the plunder theory, this skimming off theory were right, the richest countries in the modern era in Europe should have been Spain and Portugal because they had the largest empires when they conquered the new world. Spain and Portugal, in fact, remain the poorest mm. of all the European countries. How did Scandinavia get rich? How did Korea and Taiwan develop? The empire has been neither necessary nor sufficient in the development of these countries. And the reason they're workers of higher wages is because capital productivity in these countries has been much, much higher than the capital productivity and hence labor productivity in the global south. Sure, you have profits moving back and forth. And sure, some corporations do bribe their workers, as it were. But imagine if it were the case that the entire economy was one in which corporations are bribing their workers. Well, what's happened to American wages in the past 40 years? Mm -hmm. They must be the dumbest corporations on earth if they're trying to bribe their workers, but wages have been flatlining. <laughs> it's, none of it makes any sense. So it... It is one, it, it's one of those things where I just think it's a kind of fashionista left, which 
doesn't bother to even think for 10 minutes about what actually is going on. And you get these very virtue signaling um, positions. Well, I mean, the thing for for me that's like, I mean, uh, like technically, I you know, I agree with you. And I think this point is really important to make because there's, I don't know, there's just like a kind of like, I don't know, it's like an inherited understanding. Like it's a pop understanding of the way the world works, right? Um but like it, it, well, the thing that's really frustrating and there, there's a group of people I'm sure you're probably familiar with them, like the degrowthers, you know, who like to make oh, these yeah. kind of arguments a lot. Right. Um, and what really frustrates me is you have these people like in the West, right, in America and Europe, putting themselves up as the spokespeople for the third world, too. Right. And saying, like, I'm sorry, like, I, I, I have I, we know it because we saw who um, major figures in the left globally endorsed. Um, in the most recent um, presidential primaries in the U.S., they endorse Bernie Sanders, right? Like, does Moss and Bolivia, do they want there to be a weak working class movement in America or do they want there to be a strong one, right? And this like kind of like idea that um, basically we're going to try to argue domestically that like capital and workers are sort of aligned in brutalizing the world um, is just such a ludicrous political strategy to me. It um, shows a complete indifference to not just workers in the global south, but especially workers here. I just think it takes a special kind of mendacity to be sitting in the US where you have an opioid crisis in the white working class, where wages have been flatlining for 50 years, where most of the white working class now has either no insurance, health insurance, or dramatically underinsured. And you're going to walk up to them and say, hey, dude, you need to give up your privilege. You're skimming off the fat of the earth. And here's what we're going to do to save the planet we're going to actually slow down the rate of growth yeah so that there's more joblessness so that your standards of living suffer even more now let's flip the script and go to the global south what's the number one problem in the global south the number one problem it's underemployment it's insufficient investment in whether it's manufacturing or agriculture and you're going to take your degrowth stuff and you're going to go down to them and you're going to say here here's the thing in order to save the planet, you now need to have a lower standard of living. Now I'm going to go back into my jet and go back to the U.S. I have a conference where I'm getting $10,000 to say this to other people as well. It is simply a part of the wider phenomenon of an intelligentsia that cares more about style points than actually making sense of the world. If you're Matt Huber, I, I think you're going to have him on later mm -hmm. today. And Matt's made this point again and again, for which he gets nothing but abuse from the this fashionista left. If you want to have an ecological movement, you'd better figure out how to make it in the material interests of workers. And if the way you're going to do that is to say, we, we want to have fewer jobs and lower growth and less improvement in your welfare, it means you have absolutely no interest in actually doing anything about the climate. Now, here's the thing. Yeah. you can do it. You can, in fact, improve workers material well-being while saving the planet but not through this nonsense around degrowth that's why it's wild to hear actually people verbalize that no actually the because they usually they, that's the position i would take if i was a degrowther which is that no we can do all of this but when people actually say no the american worker it's like like you said about the wage and productivity growth you're basically saying that's fine it's just where the uh, excess uh um money went it didn't go to the global south it went to the capitalists like that's the only thing you're gonna change with the that's exactly capital. right i mean the i, I mean the, i in catalyst i you know i asked one of our board members rama vasudevan who's an economist to write an article on this a couple of years ago this on, on this phenomenon this idea that the american working class is, is feeding high off the hog through imperialism because if that were true, it, the last 40 years should have been the best years for the American working class because it's when American capital has expanded into the rest of the world faster than it ever has before. And yet, while it expanded, wages have actually be for the first time in American history, they've actually either flatlined or declined. So suppose there are super profits coming out of American investment. None of them are going to the workers. Mm -hmm. They're all going into capitalist pockets. Now, what that means is you have a material basis for solidarity, because now you can say American capitalists are going abroad and making tons of profits off those workers. But all those profits are going into the corporate pockets, which means there is essentially what's called global arbitrage. 
Corporations are playing brown workers and white workers off of each other. Both of them are suffering, and both of them have a common interest against multinational corporations. It, this degrowth and this labor aristocracy stuff just doesn't even get off the ground. I mean, I think that's a really like I think really gets to the crux of the the tension for me at least is that all of this stuff like the kind of um, you know the, the we could call it like neo third worldism or the degrowth stuff really tries to obscure I find sorry as like a Marxist as a socialist like the fundamental tension right is that there are capitalists and there are big corporations that are trying to screw over workers in Ohio and in South Africa. Um, and tries to obscure that into um no it's like america versus iraq right i mean it's like and of course these countries do awful awful things globally like this is not what we're denying um but this this idea that you're now sort of you're 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 not doing any class analysis in that basically you're doing but, like uh, yeah. fundamentally this this approach cannot fight imperialism because it doesn't have any way of finding out who's the agent that you're going to be organizing against imperialism. The reason you're against one is against third worldism is not because one says imperialism doesn't exist. Yeah. It's the third worldism is the organic ideology of the the aspirant bourgeoisie in the global south. I, I'm from that part of the world, mm -hmm. and there's nothing an Indian capitalist likes to hear more than for an American to say the Indian nation is being commonly exploited by American capital. That means that the Indian capitalists are also taking it on the chin by American capital because the answer then is Indian workers and Indian capitalists have to unite against global multinationals. There's nothing an Indian capitalist wants to hear more than to say, yeah, let's both come together because then now you've got this fictive community, this imaginary community of brown skinned Indians and uh, capitalists and workers and capitalists can use that ideology to essentially screw over their own workers. If you, over here, if you're anti-imperialist and you say that there's this global white supremacy, that white workers and white capitalists are, bound, are coming together, who are you going to organize against your multinational corporations who are going out into the global south? Not workers, since apparently you think those workers are already, they've already been bought and sold. So who are you going to organize? How are you going to fight American imperialism? You're going to wait around for Guatemalan peasants to do it? The way you fight American imperialism is over here, you stop the money going into the war machine you yeah. stop the money going to the imf who's going to do that graduate students if you, if you don't organize working people who's going to do it so. well i mean i would love to we should do something again on on like post-colonialism in in general because uh you know i only have an undergrad but i, I study philosophy and like my 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 professors at the university I went to were all post colonialism, so I spent a lot of time doing that. I think it's really interesting. I love your critiques on that, but we might have to do that um, another time. Um, but because I wanted to get to this a little bit, uh, like where we're at now, but maybe to get us to where we're at now, um, I, I'd like to talk about this kind of phenomenon in like the American academic left and maybe the European academic left, um, which to me has seemed to do almost everything to try to like pull class out of left so and le leftists and like socialist politics. I'll just say like, um, you know, I had a really great professor at, at the university. I won't name him now. I really appreciated him so much, but I'll never forget. Right. I'm like, I'm a poor white trash, like redneck kid. First of my family go to college. And I, I studied Marxism because I thought this was like a tool to like fight for my family and my class and all this kind of stuff. And I remember I took a graduate seminar with him on Marxism and it starts with Marx and Lenin. Um, and it's interesting when he gets to Gramsci, it's very fascinating. You add culture into the mix. And then it ended with uh, Chantal Mouffe and Ernesto Laclau's <laughs> hegemony and social strategy. And I just, I, I can't express just like the devastation I had when I finished that book, right? Because I, I'm going into it with, you know, starry out. It's like, I'm going to get these tools to fight for, for people. And I remember just holding that book at the end of it, closing, be like, this is it. This is the end yeah, of Marxism, just, right? Like this is yeah, the, you know, it's means, incredibly yeah. disappointing. Yeah. Yeah, no, I mean, I, you know, that your the general observation that the whole tendency has been towards undermining class analysis or even materialist analysis is absolutely right. And it, to my mind, uh, David, where we are right now is we often think of this moment as trying to revive and revitalize the left and try to get things going again. In my mind, to my mind, we're not trying to revitalize the left. We're having to create one from scratch. Mm. Because what the last 40 years did was 
it preserved a kind of radical culture in certain pockets, but that radicalism is one that is largely retrofitted and, and fitted to advance people's career, professional careers in the academy. Not a radical, so it's it's a radicalism that has capitalism taken out because nobody in the academy gets points for being anti-capitalist. So the kind of identitarianism and culturalism, nihilism that's now uh, passing for the left, it, it's one that you can't use in any way of revitalizing the left. So we're essentially starting from scratch now. Mm -hmm. And that's, it's a depressing thing to think about and because you have nothing. There are no unions, there's no parties, there's nothing. But it's just accurate. I, I don't think, given the devastation, that intellectual devastation, that postmodernism, identity politics, this kind of race essentialism, all of these are ideologies of an upwardly mobile professional class, some of it black, some of it white, some of it brown. And they all have really well-tuned class instincts. And that's why they never use the language of class, because they know that it's going to hurt them in their advancement. So um, that's why I'm very pessimistic about universities being the place where you can revitalize ideas at all, because um, they, they really very effectively built a wall around universities, not just of keeping Marxists out. Universities always did that. But they have, in their own culture, they have a this kind of radical vocabulary that sucks people in so that they can pose radical while pursuing their careers in a way that makes them crazy if you tell them this isn't radicalism. Mm -hmm. So I, to my mind, it's not surprising. And um, we're going to have to try to build a socialist or radical culture outside the universities because they're completely taken over. Well, you know, let's talk about that a little bit because... Um... You know, I, I think we're all in agreement that we all thought, found the Bernie Sanders campaigns, particularly 2016, um, but also 2020 in, in a lot of ways, to be really in, inspiring and hopeful um, in, in, in a lot of ways. Um, but here we are in, in 2023, and I'm not trying to say this, it wasn't a good thing, but we're sitting here, Bernie Sanders is not going to run for president again. So like that whole vehicle has gone. Yeah. And what I've seen has just been... Um, it, a, a real retreat into a lot of people who are like maybe from the older left into old tendencies and habits. Yeah. Um, I think a lot of people who maybe came to the left during the Bernie Sanders time, yeah, I don't know, maybe trying to figure out what exactly to do. But like, I mean, I feel like we're more demobilized than we have been um, even in like recent memory um, right now. And um, I'd be curious, like, um, because like, I don't know, like, I, let me like the good pitch is this. <laughs> I remember in 2015, 2016, doing DSA stuff and sometimes being really excited, but also seeing a lot of that kind of like more university left stuff coming into in, into the movement and groups. Something did happen when people had to go out and talk to people and be in public where like, you know, you know, it wasn't even that anyone won an argument. It was just like eventually like they realized, oh, this is really alienating or this doesn't work. Yeah. Um, so I wonder like how we can continue to refine and grow um, versus uh, the, the left right now versus what I'm seeing now is like more fragmentation and a lot, a lot of people retreating to some of those old tendencies. Yeah, and that's 100% right, David. Um, I, let's be very clear that the Bernie moment is over. Yeah. There, it, and it lasted, you know, it, it was not inconsiderable. It lasted about six years or so. And I gave this talk to the DSA, I think it was 2018, when I said, look, we've got about five or six years to try to make something of this. Because once Sanders retreats from the political scene, uh, there's not, there's nobody else standing uh, in uh, what's called backstage, right? Uh, this whole squad and all that, they're, they're really, their natural constituency is the university left. They're not going to, the key to, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, it's shocking that I have to say this, the key to American mo moving to the left is the white working class. You will not get anywhere if you spend all your time shitting on the white working class wagging your finger at them, telling them that they're racist, telling them that they're misogynist, telling them they're ripping off the world. The fact of the matter is they are still the largest section of the American working class. And there is only one politician on the left who has the ability to communicate to them in a way that's not patronizing, condescending, or just spiteful. And that was Bernie. Mm -hmm. Nobody else 
on the left in in the mainstream political left is able to do that. So now that Bernie's gone, you're kind of on your own. Now, I don't think um, that we have we're so demobilized that it's back to where we were in 2010. You're not yeah. old enough. You have that, that was that was a very different time. Uh, a show like this to exist, you know, there there is this. What's what, the way to think about it is the wave has receded, but it's left this residue. Mm. And some of it is mass media. Some of it is organizing. Some of it is new uh, magazines and journals. And some of it is this incipient activist left that sees the dead endism of the identity politics and how much identity politics is really just a kind of elite politics. The difficulty is there's no roadmap as to how to get from here to there, because everyone, like everyone on the post Bernie left understands that the key is labor. The mm -hmm. key is class organizing. It's just the world today is so different from the world, even 50, 60 years ago. It's not, we don't know how to get into that class and start doing these everyday organizing works. There are sections of DSA that are doing it. DSA itself will never do it. It's just, it's never going to happen that that organization becomes a working class organization. What it might do is become a place where you have a kind of a gathering ground for working class organizers who could later break away into a party, but it, it's not going to do it. What it's done is ma made a vehicle for people to bring, come together and try to start talking in caucuses and in mini conferences and things like that. So I'm, I'm not perhaps quite, quite as pessimistic as, as you sounded a second ago. I do think that it's a, the left is in a better place than it was 10 years ago, because at least it no okay. longer constantly pisses on the working class. Mm -hmm. I also think that the ruling class has a deep problem, which is that it does not have a solution to the collapse of neoliberalism. Neoliberalism has ideologically collapsed. Mm -hmm. It is not yet politically challenged. But that ideological collapse shouldn't be underestimated. Everybody knows that the jig is up. The difficulty is the only social forces organized enough to reconstitute themselves right now are capital and the servants of capital. So it could be that five years from now, we're even worse off than we are today. It could be. But the situation is fluid. And all we can do is just keep on keeping on. The key thing is not to fool yourself about anything. Understand that you're weak. Understand that a soup kitchen is not the same thing as organizing a factory. <laughs> Understand that the right, however powerful it seems, still has very, very feeble support for itself. Yes. And, and do not be intimidated by identity politics, because right now that is what the, the establishment is using to beat down on the left. And you, you're going to have to find a way of not being intimidated by it. Yeah, I mean, I, I I mean, I think that, you know, there's a lot of like, I, I totally agree that like, we're way better off than than, than we were 10 years ago. Um, you know, I was, you know, still just learning about these things at that point. But, um, you know, I think one thing, like a hurdle that's sort of in front of us is I think a lot of people who are socialists are sort of social progressives first and social second, and hopefully that can start to change. No, um, that's not going to change. Because you're talking about, David, you're talking about segments of the middle class, the best you can hope for from the class as a whole is that it not be vicious, <laughs> that, that it not be completely hateful towards working people. Um, and right now, liberalism is collapsing. It, it is collapsing into an open denigration of the very liberties and the very rights that liberalism was associated with for a long time. And that's because the late, what civilized liberalism was the working class movement. Mm. And if you look at 19th century liber liberalism, it was openly contemptuous towards working people. That's what we're, what we're sliding into again. You, what all you can hope for is a section of that liberalism is going to be the kind of troubadours for working people within its class. But the actual battering ram against the social order is going to have to come from the class itself, from mm -hmm. labor. There are parts of the middle class that commit class suicide and go organize them. But you can't expect that of more than just a few people. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, um... I mean, there's so much I re really want to get to. I don't think we're going to be able to. But like, could you talk just a little bit about like the party 
um, and, and the class, because this is something I think a lot of Americans sort of have a hard time conceptualizing, right? Because it's just not something that they experience in politics. When people hear party, they think like the Democratic or the Republican Party, which aren't parties, I think, in, in the more like Marxist political theory sense, right? No, nobody thinks they're parties, like yeah. literally nobody, e even mainstream political scientists don't think they're parties. <laughs> um, but I mean, if you could, because, you know, basically like what all what you see happen a lot is like there's all this kind of hesitation about the, the party question like there's hesitation that i have in the sense of like you can't just sit in a room even if you have like 10 people who are the most like blue-blooded working class people 10 people in the room say we are the the workers party and that's going to be the party right that we need something more rooted than that um but you also see you know people basically they get worked up about the, the way elections are set up in this country but could you talk like just more generally about like why the party is such an important organ for politics you know for class part politics in particular because i think a lot of people like the only thing that they hear when they hear the word party is like we're going to have you know the sp socialist party by a, somebody's name when they run for office and we're talking about something a little bit different than that you know um you can step back a second to to derive the answer to this and say okay what is your your how do working people year after year decade after decade fight for their interests in a situation where you have a huge geographical spread across thousands of miles across thousands of establishments you can't have what's called a movement if everybody's just doing their own thing obviously because capital is centralized the state is centralized and if your movement is just thousands of people doing their own thing, not talking to each other. The centralized forces of the ruling class are going to defeat you every time, not just through guns, but just through outmaneuvering you, right? Mm -hmm. So you have to have some, some, let's not call it a party, call it whatever you want, yeah. some centralized entity that is coordinating all these various efforts of working people. All right, well, maybe it'll be an NGO. Maybe it'll be a nonprofit. The problem with that is this. How do these organizations like nonprofits and NGOs, how do they reproduce themselves over time? Well, a party does it through membership dues, through fees, and through energizing its base. So it comes and does volunteer work, unpaid work for the organizing, right? Okay, that forces a party to be accountable. Mm -hmm. It forces it to also be democratic because if you're not going to be open and vibrant, people are going to lose interest after a while because they're going to see I'm coming to meetings and my opinions, my interests don't mean anything. Those parties fail. Eventually, if a party is going to succeed, it's going to have to discover democracy, right? And that's what all the parties, the Second International did. They were quite democratic parties, including the Bolsheviks up until 1918. Now, if, you're, if your model is like an NGO model or nonprofit model, here's the, here's the problem. Those are essentially bureaucratic entities, most of whose funds come from outside donors. And those donors are overwhelmingly from the wealthy and from the corporate class. Mm -hmm. And those are run by professionals whose main interest in keeping is in keeping their position, not in building a movement. So they're not accountable to anyone. Sooner or later, you may choose not to call it a party, but it's going to have to be a party because you need something that coordinates actions, something that is ideologically coherent and something that's accountable to its membership. Once you have that, the fourth key component can be had, which is you need somebody, some entity that learns the lessons of what's working and what's not working, understands that, okay, here's how we now at the next stage avoid the mistakes of the past because it has an interest in actually succeeding. These other entities like nonprofits have an interest only in getting their funding re renewed and getting their jobs secured. So without a, if you want your class to actually fight against capital for its rights, it's going to have to be coordinated. It's going to have to have an ideological vision, and it's going to have to learn the lessons of what works and what doesn't work. Well, you can call, you can call it a cheese sandwich if you want, but that's a party. Yeah. And until you have that, you're not going to get very far. Well, uh, Vivek, I mean, really appreciate you spending some time and, and, and talking about uh, this with us. Maybe we can do it again sometime in the future. Folks, um, you know, be sure to subscribe to Catalyst if you aren't already. Catalyst um, is, is a really, really important journal. And read Vivek's books. There are links below for people to check that out. And again, really appreciate it, friend. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Of course. Yeah, thanks, Vivek. Well, folks, um, we are going to go uh, to the post game in just one second. Uh, we're going to be joined by Matt Huber. Um, 
who will uh, be taking some questions and calls with us. We're also going to be talking about this <laughs> bizarre attack on him um, in historical materialism and uh, hopefully talking a little bit uh, about degrowth. Also, uh, you know, I'm going to have to do it just because I'm not going to have the opportunity to do it later. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about Rick Perry, <laughs> his governor. Who <laughs> David, president. David's got a, uh, he's been begging the editors, like, please find room for this. So we got to <laughs> please find room. We're going to slot it in uh, right there. <laughs> you get access to inches. <laughs> at, at patreon.com slash left reckoning. If you're going to join us in the post game, you can leave us a voicemail at 1940-289-7234. Um, get those in again, try to keep those around a minute or so. And uh, yeah, we'll be over there in about 10 minutes or so. It was an honor uh, to have Vivek on. I really can't suggest really? people, um, you know, one, I mean, read read the stuff, read the books, um, read Catalyst. And you know, you can I'd listen say to a lot of them. great podcast interviews and the stuff they put on Jackman with him is really great as well. Yeah, his, his books, the two, um, um, one, uh, Confronting Capitalism and Class Matrix, um, Useful for folks fluent in, uh, you know, left politics as, you know, I think very concise uh, navigation through like different debates and things like that, but also very useful for somebody, uh, you know, Baskar's book like this too, for people who are new to this. Yes. Uh, and, you know, that's something I like to talk to Vivek about too, is like keeping things accessible, especially because I think like David and I just like, I think there's a pressure in left media to be like the, oh, there's nothing new to me. I understand all of this and I interpret it immediately. Like that's that, like, I guess that no, it's, also, like, you know, it's just like, I know, but it's like, it's also just not true, man. I mean, like, of course, like, yeah. no, I mean, but like, even like our, like going back and reading texts we've read before, it's like, oh, wow. I've missed all of this the first time. Exactly. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And like, and like keeping it like, and so like, kind of like, I, I like, you know, uh, folks who are able to continually speak to, the people who really need to be persuaded, not like, the, you know, the people who need exactly like the kind of be what bespoke type of leftism they are. Um, but like the people who are just like, okay, I'm upset. I thought like, I believe the union Joe shit. I believe this or that. And it's like, it's not turning out that way. I think like those books are very useful. Mm -hmm. No, uh, no, for real class matrix, especially is, is really good for that. Um, but folks, we're going to be in the post game about 10 minutes. Um, so patreon.com slash left reckon to get access to that. I'll be back this Thursday with a Griscom stream, I think around three central um, with some really wonderful people from Chicago. We're going to talk about what happened there um, because it's very exciting and interesting to learn how they were successful in the mayoral, the, the mayoral race in Chicago. Um, but yeah, join us in the post game. Y'all don't, don't skip out on this one. See you soon. Peace. Thank you.